You are listening to the GAA Hour brought to you by Sports Joe and Shore. 72 hour non stop protection. Tested to the limits. Sure, it won't let you down. Hello and welcome to the GA Hour brought to you by Sure. 72 hour protection. Uh, we're a man down today. Uh, Lee Costello has a bug. Um, maybe he was overcome by all the excitement in the in the hurling at the weekend. But I'm delighted to say that uh, Neil McManus joins us today. And like myself, Neil, you were there in Croke Park for for two um, brilliant days of hurling. It was nearly like a holiday, to be honest, getting to go on on Saturday and Sunday for myself. It's it's the best uh, sporting weekend of the year, in my opinion. You get to see the four best teams in Ireland in action. Um, I know we often play football off against Hurling, uh, which is totally unfair in football because football is a super game. But I don't think there's any other sport in the planet that compares to Hurling. And it is, it's like a festival of Hurling, that All Ireland semi final weekend. Um, I, I prefer it to the final, even. It's, it's, uh, it's just it's just fantastic and especially whenever you've got the climax to the second game like we had yesterday between Clare and Kilkenny. Yeah, it is amazing because when Saturday you go to the match Saturday, Galway and Limerick, and I wasn't even planning on going back on, on Sunday, but it was just so good on Saturday that you're like, There's another day right before us now, we'll we'll go back again and um it it definitely didn't disappoint. It was probably even a, a better game on Sunday, but um yeah, you you were I suppose we were even lucky, Neil, like to be up in the press box, to be enjoying it, and to be to be working at a, a day like that. And um, I know you were on co-commentary on Saturday and punditry on Sunday. So um, h- how have you enjoyed the the new role since since your retirement? It's thoroughly enjoyable, to be honest, because like we're just discussing the things that you know you and I would be discussing in a normal conversation. Uh, over a pint or, or over a over a cup of tea, so um, it's it's great fun. Um, I'd I'd have been at the games regardless, and like you get you know I suppose you get to be involved in some very minor way, which is just brilliant. And obviously yesterday with the with the studio piece, I was alongside Thomas Neblot, uh Lee Chen, and Paul Murphy, and so you know it was. They're great lads to be doing anything with, and it was brilliant to be uh, having the crack and talking about the games with them. So uh, that was great. And then co-commentary, something I've only done a little bit of uh, previously with RTE, um, but I really enjoyed it now. And Oshin Langan was was looking after me there, and he was so well prepared that you know it made it it, it made it an enjoyable day rather than something that you felt under pressure uh, with. So that was great, and uh, very very lucky to to be in that position that. Uh, you get to go and enjoy these games and uh, I don't know have it very loosely described as work but that's not how it felt to me at the weekend I can assure you it probably is um, it's it's pressurised I suppose doing the commentary but like when you have that knowledge and you probably know every hurler in the game just with with, with a quick look so I, like that definitely stands to you when you're doing something like co-commentary it does and I think now more so than ever uh, because obviously this this is I'm just finished up, you know, uh, about a month or two uh, with Andrew. And we do so much analysis now as intercounty hurlers these days that you really do have a good handle, and not just the, you know, the, the starting fifteen, but the the people who are likely to see pitch time as well. Uh, so that's a big bonus. And actually, it's something I think it was Liam Sheedy said it to me whenever he was describing a, a panel as a whole. Uh, he said, "You're you're you know you're one to fifteen are your championship starters." Your number sixteen to twenty six are your championship finishers, and your number twenty seven to thirty five or thirty six, whatever that would be, are your championship winners. He said those are the group of people who drive, you know, the the, the panelists, if you like, uh, to try and keep their spot and, and get into that twenty six. And then those guys here in the who are on the sub bench are are driving the lads here on the team. On so it's actually it's all to do with your your twenty seven to, to thirty five or thirty six. So. Um, yeah, just being being very recently involved uh, with uh, with a, an inter county team, uh, the amount of analysis that you do does give you a, a good uh, a good insight and a good probably a good amount of information on how people play as well and little things about them as well as knowing who they are. Yeah, uh, I often wonder when when you're a co commentator there, is it tough not to? Like when there's a great goal scored, like uh, uh, even looking back at the weekend, Shane O'Donnell's goal, 
um, up in the press box. I've seen so many people just jump out of the chair when something like that happens. And, you know, your nearly instinct is to go, like, let a roar out of you. Is it tough to kind of hold it back at times? I, I didn't hold it back on, on uh, yesterday when he hit the net with that one because that's not that I was you know at any skin in the game at all really but it was just there was a sense of anticipation when that ball was played in and as soon as he grabbed it you knew it was on he's such an exciting player Shane and he's a real eye for goal obviously and whenever it hit the roof of the net we were also excited simply because it was game on and we knew that you know this was going to be a grandstand finish um so uh I, i'm sure it probably would have been hard to to hold yourself uh to uh to a respectable level of volume whenever that one hit the net but you know we were obviously we we're on when you're doing studio work you're, you're on before the game at half time and, and directly afterwards but you get to enjoy the game for what it is alongside the lads and uh um I we you know Paul Murphy certainly didn't uh, didn't cheer, but myself and Lee did because you know it made the climax what it was. Yeah, Paul was probably cheering when when Owen Murphy made the brilliant save. Um, seconds later, um, just before we get into the games, it was up in the press box where I was chatting to you, Neil, and you told me that it was seventeen or eighteen years that you were you were hurling with Antrim before you before you decided to hang up the hurl. Um, this year, so um. I suppose. How has it been since since you since you came to that decision? I, I knew all year. Uh, to be honest, this would be my last year. I considered it very very strongly at the end of the previous season. Uh, to be honest, uh, and I may have went at that stage. Only we were, for this season coming, we were missing Connor McCann and Kieran Clark, who would be our you know two inside forwards that play with most regularly Connors uh, a big physical inside full forward uh, with a great eye for a goal and then Kieran Clark is just a, ma- a magician of a player and they, they bounce off each other really well both of them unfortunately done their cruise shoots, uh, and are doing a, a serious amount of work um, to be back neither of them played any county hurling this year Connors back playing for his club now and uh, Kieran Clark uh, will probably only really be fully f- fully ready for, for training and for contact uh, come pre-season uh, of next season. So, look, they'll both be there this season. We knew we were going to be without them uh, for the 2023 campaign. So, um, I, I that was kind of in the forefront of my mind whenever I was making my decision. I'm glad I did play this year because I thoroughly enjoyed it again. And uh, I think Antrim have really developed actually in the last 12 months to to a place where I think I'll have great days watching them actually. And uh I was very happy that I could leave it um, at a stage where I was confident and uh, probably quite content with how things had went over the season in terms of where the panel's at. I wouldn't be content with all the results, obviously. Uh, I think we missed a huge opportunity to be uh, the third place team in Leinster this year, but happy that that's now the standard that we're, that we're working to and clipping at the, the heels of Wexford and Dublin and trying to make that, that step up. Yeah. Yeah, definitely um, positive steps being made. Um, I think we have to start with um, Kilkenny and Clare, Neil. Um, it was, it was uh, I suppose, right down to the, to the very end. It was, um, there was excitement. We talked about Shane O'Donnell's goal. Um, it, it goes on a few minutes and it comes up to Owen Murphy's save. Um, Brendan Cummins called it the best, the best save that he's ever seen. It had everyone, everyone in the stadium was so, I suppose, like the stadium wasn't full, but the noise at this stage of the game was, uh, it was incredible. And um, yeah, well, what a game, I suppose, look, disappointing for Clare in, in the finish, but um, I suppose we'll start with the, the atmosphere. The place nearly shook when Peter Duggan went for that volley, um, Neil, and, and Owen Murphy's save was just, uh, watching it back, the slow motion replay, it was, it was just, um, it was nearly beyond belief how he got just the, the very top of his hurl to, to flick the ball onto the crossbar. And the ball was almost already by him. It was like he was reaching behind himself to, to make the save, it, it was utterly incredible. It was like something out of the Matrix, you know. It was 
just an unbelievable save. And I'm certainly not going to disagree with uh, Brendan Cummins when he's talking about the best saves that he's ever seen. And I said that as well. I said I think that's possibly the best save I've seen because of the importance of the moment as well. And Owen Murphy is just incredible. He he's brought goalkeeping to another level. In the first half, he caught a he caught a uh, a ball that was going six eight inches over the bar. Um, like he didn't take it down. It was hurt. He caught it. You know, and like he's that's actually something that he told me he worked on at a different uh, stage, you know, and his plyometric ability to get up that high is sensational as well. But he's the whole package, he's the most comfortable goalkeeper on the ball in, in the game as well. Obviously, he plays out the field with his club, Glen Moore. Um, but as a spectacle, it was different level, I, I thought, you know, to what we've seen this year. Obviously, a fantastic monster final. Some unbelievable games in, in monster, but those twenty minutes when Claire just decided that we're going to push up and we're going to go for this, uh, they had obviously deployed Shane Amore as the sweeper, which I, I think you know he's a really good ball carrier. Um, but as a sweeper, I, I think he'd have been far better man marking somebody and maybe trying to free up you know John Conlon, for example. Um, but the, I, I loved the, the fact that Brian Lone said, OK, look, that didn't work. We're, mm. we're going to push up and go at this here. And the Clare players bought into it. Um, and they hurled the shirts off their back, really. And, and Brian Lohan must be incredibly proud of them, even though I know he had mentioned a few decisions. And we, we had a look at a couple of them as well, to be honest, and thought that, that it was harsh. But we thought they might have got a favourable one or two near the end of the game. So these things do tend to balance themselves out. Uh, the, the disallowed goal... For Claire, you know, he had blown the whistle, you know, uh, maybe a couple of seconds before that that ball had been won and stuck in the net. So, refereeing's the hardest job in the GAA. So, you know, I don't think I think I think, uh, I think he uh, I think Colum got you know probably ninety percent of them right in honesty. Um, but as a spectacle, it was just. So enjoyable to be there, to be watching those two teams going at it, and the way they played, the you know the manliness, the, the physicality they brought, the honesty, the endeavour. You know we we seen for for Sheena Donald's goal, Tony Kelly was back on the edge of the D, picking up that ball to set up uh, that opportunity, and on two different occasions we seen T.J. Reid winning ball inside his own twenty yard line, which is just phenomenal. It shows you what it meant and the lengths that those players were willing to go to to, to reach an All-Ireland final. Yeah, there are so many things, I suppose, to talk about from this game. Um, I just want to talk to you about um, Owen Murphy because I know you've, you'd have played against him on many occasions and he just strikes me as a great personality in the game and I know from up in the press box yesterday, I could even hear him shouting at different lads and giving out instructions and there was one stage as well where Mikey Butler, Mikey Butler was alongside him all day, and um, I, I wrote a piece about this too. Mikey Butler, what, what he, while he was marking him tight, he wasn't. You know, there was no dirt or there was no, um, you know, there was none of the dark arts in the way he was playing yesterday. But I seen at one stage Owen Murphy was out giving Tony Kelly a drink of water. Do you know as well? And you know, it's it's he's he just seems like a a, a great character, and I'm sure you've you've come across that um, down through through the years playing against him he's such a sound man Owen Murphy is an absolute gent he's as good a lad as you'll bump into it just happens to be that he's you know the best uh, goalkeeper of his generation really um, he's <laughs> he's so down to earth uh, so likeable it wouldn't be an uncommon trait with those Kilkenny boys regardless of the success that they've had they just seem so grounded such good lads and Owen's well up for a bit of crack as well, and he's good fun to be around. Um, so he's, and that helps. That likability factor really, really helps. And I, I would say he's uh, he's revered within that changing room. I would think because Kilkenny have continually produced these these guys who are, are in the argument for the best player of all time, and yet when you meet them one to one, be it Henry Shefflin, be it Tommy Walsh, um, or Paul Murphy yesterday. They're they're so down to earth. They're they're just really stand up lads who would never go past you without saying hello. And uh, they just love their hurling and they're just incredibly dedicated. But they 
they play the game in that brilliant kind of warrior spirit where it's body on the line for the 75, 76 minutes, however long it is, and then it's a handshake afterwards. And they're, you know, I think you, you've summed that up perfectly. Like uh, when the ball's there to be won, Will Murphy would go through you for it. But whenever he's out giving Maggie Butler a drink, Tony Kelly gets one too. Yeah, yeah. No, it just it it struck me there yesterday. Um, you mentioned the the sweeper, and it was it was a surprise. Um, hearing that 15, 20 minutes before throwing that Ian Galvin is off and Shane Amore is on. Um, <clears throat> I suppose from from then you 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 do you do think that Clare are playing a sweeper. Um, you would imagine that John Conlon, seeing as he had played that role like a lot of the year that he, he is kind of, he drops back as a centre-back, that he would be the man that did it. Um, Brian Lohan w- was was speaking about it after, and he, he said, um, do you know, we just did not want to be out of the game at half-time. And I don't know, is it, is it a bit um, surprising that they had that attitude coming up against Kilkenny, but they didn't have it, say, coming up against a Limerick? Uh, um, I think it was more Crook Park than the opposition. Hmm. Uh Crook Park has not been a happy hunting ground for Clare uh, in the past six, seven, eight years. And I think that was a factor. He wanted them to get, I, I thought it was really smart, actually. And whenever I seen the change, I knew exactly what was happening. I, I knew Clare were going to deploy a sweeper. Um, now, I did think that Shane Amari would mark and John Conlon would go free. But uh, again, um, look, that, that's, you know, uh, sorry, Brian Lohan seen that differently. But... I, I just thought that John Conlon's distribution of the ball is so good and he's so composed. Um, he's obviously, I know Tony's captain, but, but John's the leader of, of that team. You can tell it on the field just by how he plays. Like Nobody plays with less regard for their own body than John Conlon. He's an absolute warrior. Um, and you need your sweeper, actually, to be that type <coughs> of player because there will come a time when the opposition break the line and that person has to get back and just throw themselves uh, in front of whatever danger is there and John will do that for you with his heart in his hand. So, uh, yeah, I, I I found it strange that, that it wasn't uh, John who was the speaker, but I thought Brian Lohan got it right. I, I think, uh, had I been setting up Claire yesterday, regardless of the opposition, I think having a seventh defender was probably a good idea um, just to ensure that the, the same thing that has happened to them again uh, or has happened to them before didn't happen again and he protected against that pretty well they were five points down at half time <laughs> and uh, I think you know that allowed them to settle and then he said okay now look we are five down we need to go for this um, and they have the forwards to go for it I, I know why he hasn't done that all year really uh, in some other games because whenever you play a sweeper you obviously give the opposition a sweeper too Clare's forwards are unbelievable. Clare's Claire's six front six are as good as anything in the game. So uh, you know you're you're obviously helping the opposition in terms of tying down your your biggest asset and, and Clare's biggest asset is their forward line. But look, uh, I, I think that they, I understand the reason why they done it, and then obviously with the five point deficit at half time, they had to push up, and they went for it. Um, but I think it. The only thing I would have done differently is I would have kept somebody in beside Peter Duggan. Peter Duggan had his best game of the championship by a mile yesterday. Um, that's a that's a real good trait. If you can have a, an average season, which, which by Peter's standards he, he had, and was able to produce that sort of level of performance uh, yesterday on, on, on the biggest of days, is a, is a really good trait to have. Um, he's a serious player and he, he's capable of those moments of brilliance. We, we've seen one of them uh, in, the, in the semi-final, I think it was 2018, possibly. Uh, that point. Yeah, he scored that ridiculous point, um, you know, which is phenomenal. And he almost done it again yesterday with that volley for the goal, um, where he just hit it, on the, hit it uh, on the snapshot first time, which was... That, and that was moving. Peter hits the ball incredibly hard, which just makes it more. It makes the save more impressive. Um, but yeah, Claire, Claire should have kept somebody in beside him. You know, I know they kind of went for a, it. Was kind of a bit of a diamond formation with the the four forwards and, and Peter uh, then on, a lone man inside in the square. But they should have had you know Mark Rogers or Sheen O'Donnell in playing off Peter. I thought Peter ended up a, a bit of an island. 
by himself and he, he actually done pretty well I thought um, with the ball that came in uh, he, he won quite a bit of it um, made it stick uh, and I think that's the only thing tactically I would have changed uh, from a clear point of view I'd have made somebody push up with him because look Kilkenny were, 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 impl- were deploying uh, Richie Reid just in front of him really and all that Hugh Lawler was going to have to do was break the ball and it was Richie Reid's then um, so it was a really hard task for Peter. I've had that job before, and it's it's a, a thankless enough one. But I thought he he done it pretty well, and I think the Clare scores they got in the first half were you know moments of individual brilliance, great scores from from hard hard angles and great bits of running uh, that that weren't having to be replicated in the Kilkenny side. They just kind of used the ball better, played more to their system, and mm-hmm. you know were were a little more at ease and. They, the Kilkenny forwards took on the Clare bags much more uh, and obviously one more freeze as a consequence and TJ had already uh, become the highest scorer in the championship by half time I think um, ever so uh, yeah I think that will be the only thing that Brian might look back on and say you know I wish I had pushed somebody up alongside Peter but I think Brian Lohan's overriding the motion after that game will be pride in the, in the performance that his, his players put on because uh, the they carried out the, the game plan the first half. Okay, they 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 were a little bit further behind than they wanted to be, but they clearly just wanted to be in the game at half time. And then the second half, whenever he told them, Okay, shaggles are off, lads, we're gonna go for it they threw everything at Kilkenny. Mm. Absolutely everything. And uh, <coughs> you know, whenever your team give you that that level of effort, it would be so hard to uh, to think of it as a failure because even though Kilkenny go through to the All-Ireland final, there was no losers in that Clare team yesterday. Yeah. Um, you're right about Peter Duggan, um, Neil. He, he, like, what an unbelievable game that man had. And as you said, he, he was up against it with ball coming in on top of him, Hugh Lawler behind him, Paddy Deegan in front of him. But he loves Croke Park, and we've seen it that day against Galway in 2018. He maybe hasn't been um, at, you know, the, he hasn't reached that level since maybe coming back from Australia, I would say, to the level he played yesterday. But, um, man, he was fired up yesterday. Himself and Hugh Lawler were having some, they were getting horsing into it as well. And you could see the kind of sportsmanship between them two at different stages. I remember one time Duggan kind of knocked Lawler over the line to win a 65 and Lawler was in a bit of bother and Duggan comes over and gives him a pat on the back as the ball um, when Rogers is hitting the 65. So, um, And the same for, for John Conlon too. You mentioned that he did disregard for, for his own body and that was the case when, when he got a, a bit of a sickener, a late one off Tom Phelan. It was actually um, after one of the goal chances and, and you know, he, he, you could see he wasn't bothered but, and him coming in with the concussion um, worries as well, but he was straight back up, and I suppose that kind of sums up the spirit he has. Um, and 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 on the sweeper thing, I suppose Neil, like, do you know, if if Claire had won this game and they were so close to doing that, if if Connor Fogarty doesn't make that unbelievable block from Mark Rogers, um, and you know, if a few other little things, if Owen Murphy doesn't make that save, like we're not really talking about this sweeper as being a bad thing. And I suppose I was reading in, in the Irish Times this morning, Malachy Clerken had it that memory is a ton weight. And and you could you, that was probably what was in Brian Lohan's mind was the memory of what happened last year um, when Kilkenny ripped him to shreds and the, the game was over basically at half time. So you, you can you can see where Claire are coming from. Um, we're coming from in that perspective and I suppose in the second half as you said they, they, they kind of had to go for it they were five points down and you know they really did cut loose and it, it was all them it was it was similar enough to the Galway Limerick game the day before where Clare just completely um, took over but I suppose the frustrating thing for Clare and this is something that you'll, you'll often see with Kilkenny Neil is that like a lot of their lads did hurl well like you're thinking Dave McInerney an unbelievable game. David Fitzgerald was brilliant. Cahill Malone was brilliant. Um, and just comparing them, I thought they hurled a lot more balls, say, in the middle third than the likes of Conor Fogarty, Paddy Deegan and Richie Reid. And, you know, Don Logue had this stat in the Sunday game. Clare had a lot more possessions, a lot more shots. But how do Kilkenny do it that they're just so economical? Yeah, the, the Kilkenny are so at home in Crook Park. I think it's always where they play their best hurling. 
but it's the way they've played you know over the last i would say the last two or three seasons um it's it is limerick-esque there's no way about it they do not waste the ball uh, we had a great clip pulled on it yesterday where uh, i can't remember now exactly which of the defenders it might have been i wonder uh was it david mcinerney who he, he drove it down the line kind of aimlessly really under a bit of pressure and uh, paddy deegan just came back lifted the ball swept it up and looked up the field and you know owen cody had made a run inside but he he just seen uh he seen adrian mullen about you know 50 60 yards away he just pinged at the hand and boom the ball's played inside in the point and that was the difference you know claire did didn't mind the ball just as well as they should have uh, and Kilkenny really really do uh, Richie Reid whereas the, you know that really suited him to be playing that sweeping role he does it for Ballyhale as well obviously and he uses the ball so well TJ when he drops back he never gives away the ball um, you know and Adrian Mullen I thought you know yeah Claire, Claire did win that battle in the middle of the field uh, but Adrian Mullen you know was was on plenty of ball too um and he he played pretty well i thought now and that was his first game back in a while so that augurs well for kilkenny moving into the final because they'll need him flying he matches up really nicely with the with the uh the limerick uh midfield pairing so i just think kilkenny are really comfortable in what they're doing now they this new system where they do try to hold the ball a bit more it is a more possession based game than what they would have been traditionally used to i think they're comfortable with it now I think they enjoy playing the system that they're implementing, but it's still, it's still very much built on the hard work. Uh, it's just a different type of hard work. There's much more running off the shoulder rather than hard work under a dropping ball or hard work trying to win your individual battle. They, they, they run off the ball as much as any team that I've played against. Um, even you know whenever I was the last. The last time we played Kilkenny was in the Leinster round robin up in Belfast and uh, I was full forward and Hugh Lawler was full back but any time that the ball was pucked out to the corner back or a half back one possession Hugh Lawler was gone hoping to take the you know take the the one two with him so you have to be on your guard at all times and trying to track those runners and maybe break those runs a little bit um but that Kilkenny are now comfortable doing that they're very very physically strong they are the best place team to challenge Limerick and the physical stakes um nobody has been fully able to do that yet but i think kilkenny are the best place to do it and it just remains to be seen can they create enough opportunities i think they'll need goals to beat limerick um can they create those goal scoring chances because if they can create them i believe they would finish them they have the they have the marquee forwards um but uh it's set up brilliantly so it is actually for an unbelievable final i think uh, i think limerick will win it I think it'll be really, really tight, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if Kilkenny were able to get over the line, but I think they'll need goals to do it. Yeah, well, the man that got the goal yesterday was was Owen Cody, and um, between himself and Adrian Mullen, the Ballyhale connection, two of them were 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 unbelievable. Um, a special, I suppose, credit to Mullen when he's only back his first game in a long time, and any, any sports person knows how tough it is to slot straight back in when you haven't been playing the last few games but he, he was just he's so good in the ball and it was no bother to him um, Owen Cody after the match he was interviewed and Damien Lawler says Owen can you make any sense out of that and Owen Cody was straight back he said yeah I can make plenty of sense out of it to be honest we're a good team I don't think a lot of people um, give us credit uh, Owen is a, a great um personality as well we had him on the show here before but um the goal he got it, it's something that claire will be they'll be having nightmares and they were they're so good at that short passing and i suppose michael diagnan summed it up in the commentary though he said when you're when you've just taken control in an iron semi-final that's not the time to get clever and i suppose that was just the way it was and rory hayes was caught out and um you, d- you don't give tj he got the ball. You don't give him that chance, and you don't give it to Owen Cody the form he was in yesterday. No, they'll, they'll be mightily disappointed uh, in that sequence of play. I actually started a little bit earlier in terms of Eva Colligan had an opportunity uh, to let the ball go long, and he stepped back inside uh, and gave Rory Hayes the ball whenever he was under a little bit of pressure, and he, you know, he couldn't get his feet set to to strike, so he was going to have to try and break a tackle. Um, so he was kind of he was almost set up to fail. Uh, and he'll be 
you know, God, he'll have nightmares about that, all right. Um, now, it was a brilliant rob, in fairness, to the uh, to the Kilkenny forwards. They work like dogs, and, you know, as soon as it was turned over and, and, and fell favourably for TJ, he always takes the right option, gave it to him, Cody, and he just fired it low, uh, low to the net. But, like, Claire really didn't have to take that chance. That's what will we'll really be irking them today. They could have just put that ball on. They were winning the ball long. And uh, it's just unfortunate that they, you know, decided to try and play it out in that exact instance. And Michael Dignan's just right. Momentum was with them. And those things just, that was totally against the run of play, that goal. And it was the difference in the game is, is the long and the short of it, unfortunately. You have to make people work for every score. And, you know, whenever you're giving them away, you're really doing yourself a disservice. As you said, the Kilkenny forwards, they're always working. They're working as hard as, as any backs, and it was a credit to Billy Ryan there that he, 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 he like he, he could have easily kind of just said, right, Quilligan and Hayes have this. This ball is gone. He came in behind Hayes, and Hayes couldn't really see him coming because he came from the angle. Um, so brilliant from him. You you mentioned TJ Reid there, and he was interviewed after the game, and he was told. Do you know you've you've passed out Patrick Horgan, you're the you're the top scorer in in the championship um, history now. And I thought it was funny his response. He said, "Well, first he said, did I?" And then he said, "Ah, ah I see Hoggy is coming back next year." So um, do you know that kind of that sums up um, TJ. And I, I'm sure himself and Patrick Horgan will have uh, another shootout in the in the weeks to come. Um, we'll come back with a small bit about the, with a chat about the Limerick and Galway game. But first, we're going to the Shore No Sweat Quiz. In partnership with our friends at Shore, official statistic partners of the GA, we're now going to look at the most eye-catching stats from the championship weekend. Last week's winner is Owen Brady, who correctly told us that Dublin's Colin Basquell is the top scorer from play in the Gaelic Football Championship. Uh, for this week's quiz, we're going to stay with stats and top scorers. And the question is, who did TJ Reid surpass as the top scorer in hurling championship history yesterday with his 12-point tally? So who did TJ pass out? Um, so now it's up to you, our audience, uh, Give us the answer to this stat-related question on our social media to be in with a chance of winning some sure themed prizes. Winners will be announced on the show next week. Okay, so um, Limerick and Galway. Um, I don't think there's anywhere else to start really other than the 25th minute of this game. And at this stage, you're thinking it's 112 to 16. Um, Galway are on fire. We're after watching... Um, some of the best 25 minutes of hurling I, I would say of the year um, and you're thinking are Galway and Limerick are these two are these this, are these streets ahead are these the, the two standard bears the best teams in the country and this is them at their peak and Galway on fire Brian Concanon Br- Connor Whelan um, and I suppose to break the momentum and it was highlighted all over the place really um, Nicky Quaid goes down um, and and there's a, there's a break in the play. Henry's going mad. Um, I suppose. What were your thoughts on, on the game up to that stage, Neil? Up up until that stage, uh, Galway should be further ahead. Is the truth? They had missed a couple of chances, and Cahill Mannion playing in a slightly more advanced role. And t- to to be totally honest, the Limerick midfielder were struggling to pick him up whenever he made those runs uh, through. And I don't think anybody was totally sure who was marking him. Uh, And whenever he broke through for the goal, obviously, you know, Kevin took it wonderfully out of the air. And it was, I didn't see the pass on, even though you and I had the best seats in the house. And whenever he drove it into the turf and it popped up perfectly for Cahill, he decided to carry it on. And obviously he he finished it an absolute rasper. But he he was really good in that period. Limerick were struggling to get the grips with him and you know had they taken all their opportunities you know it, it would have been very very interesting to see Limerick's response to it mm-hmm. but Nicky Quaid as you say 25 minutes gone on the clock he realises you know we're six points down we're we're under the cosh here and uh, a bit of gamesmanship he took off his helmet and it, it's fair enough from his point of view he decided I'm going to do this uh, and it's then, you know, the ball's in the referee's court at that stage, really. Uh, I know at one stage, uh, during one of our championship matches this year, 
uh, the full back went down one knee, took the helmet off, and the referee was coming in, and I just shouted out at him, he's just wasting time, he's just wasting time. And the referee turned around and just blew the whistle and said, get the puck out. out. Um, so I don't know what what is the, the avenue <laughs> available to the referee, or the referee in that scenario. Can he give two men? On the twenty yard line, uh, you know what can he do to say no? Look, you're not pucking out the ball. You're holding up the game deliberately uh, without without any cause to do so. And uh, I'd love to have seen the referee just do that to say no. This is gamesmanship. I'm throwing it in the twenty yard line and see whatever happens. And that would have really added to the atmosphere. But Nicky Quaid took a chance, and uh, I would say John Kelly and the the Limerick backroom team were very happy that he did. But Nicky's probably, I think he is the eldest player on the on the Limerick team. He's, a, he's an experienced man. Um, I think he, he might be the only player over the over the thirty mark, which is scary for everybody else. But he uh, he he took a chance and he got away with it. Well, well, it happens a lot. Um, it's happened a lot this year. Now I noticed in in the Calera Scammon football game. After a scum got a goal, uh, a score, two Kildare lads went down, and the referee just went in and booked um, one of them, or, or gave the, yeah, I think he booked one of them and told them, lads, you, like I know what you're up to. Um, it happened ten minutes later in Limerick and Galway. Uh, Kyle Hayes, it was, it was he. He kind of just he was in a collision with Darren Morrissey, and he kind of just took his own helmet off and thrown it on the ground, trying to um, create another stoppage, and the ref. Um, was James Owens was having absolutely none of it and he just waved the play on this time. Um, so I suppose he, he had it in his mind from the time before. But I actually watched it um, when when the team doctor ran into Nicky Quaid and he actually did absolutely nothing. Like, Nicky Quaid just bent down and the doctor just stood beside him and all the while John Kiley is, is roaring in instructions I suppose to try and um, ch- to change the flow of the game and for Limerick to kind of reset. And... It was funny, the exact same thing happened watching the Cork and Kilkenny Camogie game yesterday. It was after Kilkenny got a score and um, the Cork goalie just goes down and it's the contact lens trick again. So it is it is becoming a bit of a, a, a bit of a blight on, on the way the, on the games because when you have momentum, it's it's the last thing you want is do you know five minutes and that's what the other team wants. Yeah, I, I think we do we we need to Give the referee some tool to deal with that situation where he deems that the you know the game has been held up uh, well w- without cause um, and support the referee in terms of doing that and let him make the call that he maybe does throw the ball in on the twenty yard line right in front of the net of the the, the offending team uh, because you know that would would booking Nicky Quaid have done anything really it may have just yeah. taken up a little bit more time. Uh, different for an outfield player because then he's under pressure about whether or not he can make a tackle or not. Or maybe both. Maybe you should book the player who's wasting the time and throw it on the 20 yard line, you know? Definitely. Um, the, I suppose the turning point then from then on was was the save that Michael Casey made. Uh, Kevin Cooney ran through and flicked it to Brian Concanon, who actually on the replay got, you could see he made a great connection and it was, it was luck really. Um, maybe a bit of luck, a bit of skill from Michael Casey that he just held his hurl out and hit the nose of the hurl. So that was a huge, um, a huge turning point. And then Limerick just gradually got back into the game. The ball went down the other end of the field and Daryl Donovan, who was probably their best player in the first half and the man who kept them in the game when they were struggling, he scored an unbelievable point after he'd just been dispossessed down the wing. The ball was worked back out to him and he did brilliantly to stick it over. And this kind of kick-started the Limerick revival. They were back to winning a point um, at half time, and you could see that Galway, like they should have, as you said, Neil, they should have been up by more and they were kind of trudging off and at half time and you're nearly you can nearly see what's coming as it came in the second half then yeah the, Limerick obviously everybody's well aware of how they they target and perform in that third quarter uh, that's when you have to be able to stick with them and, and Galway couldn't as it turned out but you know you're right the cushion should have been so much more uh, you know it wouldn't have been totally against the run of play for Galway to have went in eight, nine points up, in truth. Um, and that save from Mike Casey, I know he didn't know very much about it, but, you know, at the end of the day, he still got, he, he got his hurt to it, whether whether he, uh, 
it was intentional or not. And it is a game of fine margins, and it's all about keeping momentum flowing in your favour. If that hits the back of the net, you know you would fancy Galway to kick on and, and and push push for push for another score in the back of it because they got let offs. Like Limerick shooting in the first half was particularly poor. Um, I, I think they had six or seven wides in the first half, and there's games you know that go by 76, 77 minutes, and we we don't see them having seven, eight wides. So. Galway had a real opportunity, a real opportunity, and yeah, they they'll be kicking themselves um, because it's it's one it's one that they've missed. Uh, but it's hard not to be impressed by Limerick's reaction to adversity. You know, being the six points down, um, it would have been more interesting now if, if they were the eight nine down coming into the second half. But like. Jeremy Burns, I thought, really led the, the renaissance for, for like, the way he hurled. He just wouldn't take a backward step. Mm. Uh, in that second half, he started to really dominate that area of the field. He was catching high ball, driving out, playing one-twos. and uh, Then he, he started to nail the freeze as well because he had missed a couple. And He's just a leader, but it does. It's still fairly reliant. I thought that their two, you know, their two, two best performers were Aaron Galan and Seamus Flanagan. They make every ball stick. They're an incredible inside pairing, and the way Limerick do work the ball out to you know the sixty-five or in around midfield, and then they play the cross-field ball, mm. and then you see Glan, uh, whoever whoever collects the ball, you see Glan and Flanagan trying to almost run past each other and switch across, and if they can manage to flick, use the offload. Sometimes they, they they use that guy as a decoy runner and they flick the ball over the bar, but sometimes they they'll try and offload to the other one. He's coming at pace and it opens up a a brilliant goal opportunity. It's very hard to defend against, even though you know what they're trying to do. Because you know we've seen that pattern so many times now from from Limerick. But um, like Galan's goal, like like he he caught that ball in the first half. You know, whenever uh, Tom Morris he just floated in on top of him, he caught that ball off Dahi Burke. You know, Dahi Burke is four All Stars in a row in the full back line. That is not an easy thing to do. Um, and he, he obviously finished it well. And I, I kind of thought. In the first half, Aaron Galan kept them in it. In the second half, Flanagan nearly took over a little bit. Even though Galan got the second goal, was, you know, I, I think he was the he was the match winner. Actually, there's no doubt about it. Did he have two, three from play? You know, he's, he's he takes some stopping. Yeah, um, like you mentioned, the ball coming in, and it's like Darrow Donovan put in some of the most unbelievable balls you could see right into Galan's path. The very first one, actually, of the of the second half, Neil, he hit it into. Gillan and Gillan controls it exactly as he said and, and Flanagan it, it collects it and it's straight over the bar so they're kind of they're flying and they're right at that rhythm straight away into the second half so so that was perfect for them there was another time when you mentioned the decoy runner there it just popped into my mind Gillan was running through for his point and Hegarty runs by him and Gillan just pretends to give the hand pass and he's gone the other side so they know how to use that um, brilliantly just last thing on this game Neil like Aaron Gillan Donal Cusick said it on the Sunday game, like he, he uses defenders as a target and he, he kind of, he, he, he often, he can go from the front, but when it's, when it's his goals, he's coming from behind and he's like a predator. He's in behind them and he's, he's kind of prowling around behind them, waiting for something to happen. And the Tom Morrissey ball was the perfect example. It comes in exactly as he's looking for it and he's just gliding in the air. He's hanging up there and his hand it just never looks like he's going to not to drop a ball like that. He's he's in he's in he's in great form. So his two best performances this year have been the Munster final and uh, this weekend just passed with the semi final again. As we spoke about with Peter Duggan, great trait when your best performances come on the biggest occasions. But we've just seen this now over the past five years or so with Arn. He's, 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 he's developed into a very physically strong uh, inside forward as well. And Dunlog is exactly right. And it is, it, it's, the, it's the A position, if you like, whenever that ball is landed on top of the full back and you're in behind him. A, a, a man who used to play front and for a long time called Paddy Richmond from Dunloy used to do this with serious regularity. And he would just sneak in behind, the ball would be on top of the full bag, he'd come over the top, play the hurl and he'd grab it and he'd be gone. Because whenever you're in behind then and once you've secured the ball, you don't have anybody to beat other than the keeper. So uh, 
Limerick are doing that. You know, that's it's not an accident. Whenever they see the, the full back playing out in front for obvious reasons to try and stop the run uh, or stop, stop the ball coming in in front of Aaron Galan, they're landing it on his head and they're backing Aaron Galan to win that aerial duel because it's very, very hard uh, for you to set up properly and hold the man off whenever they have that jump coming from behind you over your shoulder. Um, and Galan's goal, you know, again, that one was even against the run of play a little bit, to be honest. Uh, and he he just comes up with the answers constantly for Limerick. Uh, you know, ball out in front, ball in over the top. He can do it. He's, he's, he's tough. He's physical. Uh, one of the, you know, the first time I really thought, yeah, he's the real deal. It was Claire against, uh, against Claire, yeah, in, in the Gaelic grounds. Um, I think it's four seasons ago now. And after he scored a goal, he came out and he buried the Clare full back with a, with a shoulder when it should be the other way about, in my opinion, you know. Um, but he was saying, you know, I'm here for the battle. I'm I'm physically capable, let's go type thing. And he was loving it. He loves that physical contact and loves that battle. And yeah, he's a, he's, a, he's a serious, serious player. And and Kilkenny will have to find a way of, of stopping him. I don't know which one of their, their inside backs suits him best. It is probably Hugh Lawler because Hugh Lawler is incredibly quick and people don't often remark upon that, but he is very, very quick. Um, and I, I think that's, the, even though people will probably think Seamus Flanagan and Hugh Lawler tie up very nicely, I think I'd put, I'd put Hugh Lawler on, uh, on Aaron Glan because I do think they'll have to stop him if they want to stifle that Limerick forward line. Oh, Gillan, Gillan is the man, definitely. Um, yeah, you may, is it, Do you think it should be the back that if, if a person scores them, they should be the one going, going in to, listen, you got that, uh, I'm still here? If I was playing full back, um, I think I don't think I'd be uh, I'd be welcoming a, a shoulder off of a, a forward who's just buried one in the back of my net. You know, um, I think you know it shows a little bit of a, a dip. You you have to maintain that 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 body language that says you know no I'm I'm here all day and I'm going to be with you for every step that you take here today. And it doesn't matter if you just scored a goal or it doesn't matter if you just had a wide. I'm, um, if you go for a shower, I'm going to be there to reach you a towel, that type of thing. Yeah, um, that's definitely it. Listen, Neil, um, thanks a million for, for coming on today. Um, a, a great weekend of hurling, and uh, we, we're, we're lucky we've, we've another great day to look forward to with the All Ireland final. Um, and listen, thanks a million for coming on. Before um, the, the two hurling games, we obviously had the, the Camogie quarterfinals. Tipperary played Antrim um, on on Saturday as the curtain raiser to Galway Limerick, and Tipperary were were very much up against it for the first half an hour. And do you know they, they went in at half time and were, were under a good bit of pressure. They pulled away as you would expect in in the second half. Coach Devan was brilliant. Karen Kendi was brilliant. But Roshan McCormick definitely impressed for for Antrim. I suppose the big game of the weekend was uh, was Cork and Kilkenny. They've had such a fierce rivalry. Kilkenny beat them last year, and Cork Cork obviously won yesterday, won by a point, um, but. They just couldn't, they couldn't, the, the player of the match was Denise Gall and Cork just really struggled to get to grips with her. She scored 1-10 on the day. Her, her, her goal at the end was, was just absolute composure and she showed such class and all the class that she has really to keep Kilkenny in that game. Um, after the, the match, she was given the, the player of the match interview and, and it, was, it, was, it was a funny enough moment. She, she, like, she was obviously devastated, very disappointed after losing the game, but uh, Fergalini, the Glenn Dimplex uh, CEO, they're the sponsors of the Camogie Championship, he gives her the prize, which is a, a, it was a stereo or a speaker, which isn't a bad prize, probably better than the, than the usual um, dust collector of a plaque. Um, but uh, it was a it was a direct quote um, from Denise as she looked down to speaker. This doesn't really uh, mean much to me, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> which was which was uh, quite funny. But look, a, a brilliant game, and Corker now heading through to the semi final. They'll be buoyed by the return of Ashling Thompson from her crucial injury. She came on. Um, in the second half, that's going to be a huge game. It's obviously a huge opportunity on the other side of the draw for Waterford and and Tipperary. One of them will get through to to the final. So um, 
huge for them. There was a small bit of controversy at the end of the Cork and Kilkenny game um, where John Darmody, the referee, he had he had a, 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 a poor enough game, to be honest, and Amy O'Connor should have been given a penalty uh, very late on. Aoife Norris, the Kilkenny j- j- goalie, almost ripped the jersey off her. Um, as she was going through for a goal, but and and then I suppose it was in his head that he should have given that penalty, and Katie Power deserved a, a last minute free to level things up and didn't get it, and herself and Brian Dowling collared the referee at the final whistle. So look, I suppose it, it's we we know we were chatting with Neil earlier. It's it's so difficult for referees. Column Lines was so unlucky with that Mark Rogers goal that he he had just blown the whistle just before the chance. Um, came but um a very tough job so so we're not going to um give out about referees but yeah lots to look forward to with the camogie and the uh, the hurling final the camogie semi-finals and the hurling um final coming up in the the next fortnight okay so thanks to neil for coming in uh for the chat and thanks to our sponsors sure 72 hour protection um and we'll be back next week looking ahead to the football to the hurling and to all the rest of the the championship games as the summer heats up. You've been listening to the GAA Hour, brought to you by Sports Joe and Shore. 72-hour non-stop protection, tested to the limits. Shore, it won't let you down.